The interior walls of this house are made from 2x4s and they go up pretty quick because there are no windows, there are fewer or no plumbing penetrations, no heavy glue lamb headers over the openings, and so they're lighter and they're easier and they're faster and that's a welcome change. Now two by fours are just fine for an interior wall because there's no insulation going on inside. A lot of times they are just partitions, not carrying any loads, not having any insulation to keep the cold out and the warm in, but they're just standing there holding the drywall. Now a couple of these walls will be helping support the ceiling joists and a couple will actually receive some beams in the second floor system and in the roof system, but most of these walls are simply partitions and a 2x4 is plenty strong enough for that. Just like the exterior walls, we are plumbing them as we go. You don't need quite as many braces for interior walls because they're shorter and they are interlocking at such close intervals that they tend to hold each other in a plumb position. If the first two or three are plumb and braced, the rest of them are going to stand there exactly where you want them ordinarily. The diagonal braces that you see stretching across the longer walls are there to give some temporary shear strength while the floor is being put on and while the wall sheathing goes on. And yes, there's a reason that I stood up the exterior walls without sheathing them first while they were on the ground, and I'll talk about that a little later on. Now I understand full well that there are a lot of different building methods around the world. In fact, I understand it better now than I did a few years ago before I started watching YouTube, and some of you started watching our channel. And so I understand that building with lumber like this is non-typical for some of you viewers. If you're watching this and thinking, I have never in my life seen any building like that ever, that makes no sense at all. Here's a couple of things for you to think about. Lumber it has historically been cheap in Southern Oregon. Now it's not that cheap now, but it is the least expensive structural building material that's available to us. Now, in different places across the United States, that may not be the case, and you would see more block or brick or ICF concrete form homes, particularly in areas that are prone to hurricane or, you know, different conditions that require a stronger building. But around here, up and down the West Coast, and in most of the country, you will even see large apartment complexes, large apartment complexes and motels and some commercial buildings built with this type of construction and usually for the same reason. It's affordable. Now these videos are making the process look slow and drawn out. But in real life, and especially in a production setting, you would be amazed how quickly this all gets done. The main task we're working on today is called plumb and line, as in we're going to plumb and line the walls, or what does this job pay for plumb and line? You can think of it as fine tuning. You can think of it as a little insurance work, because when we get up and start building the floor system on the top, we don't want to have to think even once about whether or not the crown plates that we're nailing to are actually in the right spot. We want to be certain that everything that happens moving upward from here will be right because everything that below it, that was below it was right. So the primary importance of this crown plate is to lock all the walls together. The bottom plates are locked together because they're nailed to the subfloor. The, the top of the wall is held together by the overlapping intersections at the wall corners of the crown plate. The crown plate can be put on almost entirely while the wall is on the ground, while it's being built. But sort of for ease of installation and to make sure that that I don't make any kind of a real grievous error, I tend to put about half of them on in place. If there's any question about exact overhang or how much space I need to accommodate to plummet, I, I usually put these things on about half of it 
while they're standing on their feet. I have really good confidence now that these walls are square and that the corners are plumb. The only thing remaining is to make sure they're true or straight. So I've stretched strings spaced an inch and a half off of the outside of the wall all the way around the perimeter, or at least on the long walls. And since I know that it's an inch and a half away from the framing on both ends, I will just brace and push or pull the walls in between the intersections until a gauge, an inch and a half gauge, run up and down from the bottom tells me, yep, the wall's an inch and a half away from the string, all the way up and down all of the exterior walls. There are other ways to get this done if you don't have turnbuckles. They all involve controlled leverage, and you will see us use various methods during this process. A lot of times, and especially for new framers, getting things perfect can be sort of frustrating. You might go around and around adjusting and pushing and plumbing your walls and discover that you're fighting and wrestling with the same eighth inch error and chasing it all the way around your building. Generally, there are two ways that these errors can happen. First is that there is a big and obvious mistake in the length of some part of one of your walls. Maybe you cut on the wrong side of a line. Maybe you're half an inch off right there in that spot. Maybe a wall was inadvertently cut with two different length plates, a longer top plate or a longer bottom plate. If you snoop around, you might be able to find the exact place the mistake was made, correct it, and everything right then should start to get a lot less frustrating and things should begin to fall into place. The second possibility is that you have an accumulation of very small errors that are working together to create a larger error. It is good practice when boards are connecting with each other to shorten your measurement just a little bit to allow for the gap that will never close any time two boards are brought into contact. If you have four or five or six different junctures of wood to wood, perhaps in an accumulating wall height, by the time you get to the top, you may have gained a quarter of an inch or five sixteenths or three eighths, even though each board was the right length. Just the slight deviations in the actual texture of the cut increase the distance as the, as the boards and the components come together. So watch for the small incremental gains or losses that can add up to a real frustration at plumb and line time. Well, the first floor is pretty much framed up and plumb and lined and braced into place and from here we are going on up. The next video in our series will be setting a beam, building some temporary scaffolding, and a few odds and ends before we start in on the second floor itself. Thanks for watching Essential Craftsman, and keep up the good work.
Thank you.